Good. So where did we stop yesterday? And this improves which is approximation. I think that I need to prove today. Okay. So the um, the statement that we want to prove, therefore, is the following. So there are two geometric constants, epsilon gamma bigger than zero, in gamma. So she has the following holds. So we let V be um, an area minimized the function describing an area minimized graph will control will control a Lipschitz constant. sufficiently small excess in the city. is that um, there exists a set K inside the ball of values 1 minus E to the power gamma, which satisfies the following two estimates. So what is left from say this radius is actually going to be called rho. So what is left in the ball of radius rho outside of this set K is less or equal than e to the power of 1 plus gamma. And the Lipschitz constant of the restriction d to this good set is controlled by e to the power gamma. Okay? And what we already said last time is that, so this is an improvement which is using the fact that the um, function is actually, uh, the, the graph of the function is area minimizing because what we know is that this excess is comparable to the L2 norm squared of the gradient of U, of the gradient of V, and then such an estimate if you truncate on the lower level of the maximum function of the derivative of u squared, then such an estimate will hold, uh, but having here e to the 1 minus 2 gamma instead of e to the 1 plus gamma. OK, so here is how we're going to actually make the improvement. So first of all, we, need, we do, so we fix a small parameter lambda. So this is going to be related to our gamma over there. And that's where actually we make the truncation with the maximum function. And so we said K. Ah, and maybe, and maybe there's a little remark before. We are actually going to cheat a little bit. So instead of passing to the ball of radius 1 half, uh, instead of passing to the ball of radius 1 minus e to the gamma, we are going to pass from the ball of radius 1 to the ball of radius 1 half. So we are going to set actually rho equal to 1 or 2. Uh, you might then wonder how am I going to improve to 1 minus e to the power of gamma. Well, I did apply actually the escape version of the theorem to balls which are of size e to some power and then make a coupling. Okay, and then this means that the gamma that we get over here in this theorem compared to what we get in this proof will be deteriorated. Okay, but if I play the exponents correctly, I will still be able to do that. So 
it is it is somehow less technical to pass from the ball rings one to the ball rings one half. Uh, and you might even notice that in fact for the final proof of the excess decay, if I wanted to be sufficiently sloppy on how small, so we, we made the excess decay from the ball radius one to the ball radius one half. If I had been happy to pass from a ball radius one to a ball of very tiny radius, but you know, controlled with a constant, actually even a even a proof of this approximation theorem with row equal one half would be good enough. Okay, so now we're going to set k to be equal to the point x in the ball of radius one half, where the maximal function of dv squared is less or equal than e to the power two lambda. Okay, and so now this maximal function m of dv squared on the point x is by definition the supremum over all radii r less than one half of the um, integral of modulus of dv squared and then here I um, multiply by half to the minus n and here I have e to half of x. Okay and so it is it is I mean there are two classical facts that you can for instance find in the book of Evans and Gagliati. And the two classical facts here are that now the Lipschitz constant of V restricted to the set K is less or equal than a dimensional constant times E to the lambda. And the size of what is left, uh, oh, and right. <coughs> so, and the size of what is left, and for some reason I'm actually, maybe I want to do this with one quarter. And this one I want to do with three quarters. So the size of what is left, um, okay, it's in fact control by Chebyshev with a constant times e to the power minus two lambda, and here I have the integral over the whole ball of radius one of dv squared. Okay, and this I know is less or equal than a constant and e to the power one minus two lambda. Okay, and the good idea is that now I want to actually improve. So what I what I want to do is I want to improve this to a constant times e to the power of one plus something. And so as soon as I gain over here one plus something, then I will take, uh, for gamma, I will take a little bit less than the minimum between this exponent and how much the better estimate here exceeds one. And then of course, here I'm not even putting a constant c because if I choose somehow my exponent smaller, I can use the epsilon bar to actually swallow the eventual constant that I have here in front. Okay. So what am I going to do? So I want to do the following. So I want to take first of all uh, z uh, or maybe w. So we let w be um, a Lipschitz extension of uh, v restricted to k to the whole ball b of various three quarters. Okay, and this Lipschitz, I mean, I, uh, there exists very easy proofs that there is a Lipschitz extension which keeps uh, uh, which, 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 which makes the Lipschitz constant uh, uh, worse by a factor square root of n. Okay? Actually, the best theorem is speech ground theorem, which is more subtle because here we are in a vector value situation, which tells you that you can find the Lipschitz extension whose Lipschitz constant is exactly the same. Okay? But we don't need to be that uh, uh, refined somehow. So uh, what, 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 I, what I just need is the following simple bound. Okay, 
And then what I want to do is I want to regularize uh, W by convolution. Okay, so then we fix <coughs> another parameter theta. Um, bigger than zero and define uh, Z to be the convolution of W with a smooth kernel which I denote by phi and the uh, size of the convolution is going to be e to the power theta. Okay, so phi standard modifier. I would like to do the following. I would like to use I would like to use this W to make uh, to build up a competitor for my V and compare the volume, the n-dimensional volume of the graph of the competitor with the n-dimensional volume of the graph of V. Okay, and then use the area minimizing property to actually connect up to the estimate. Uh, but of course, I cannot do that directly, meaning that. Uh, w and V disagree on the complement of the set K and of course Z and W disagree probably everywhere so to actually use Z as a competitor for V I have to make a cut and paste argument on some on some radius okay so I'm going to choose a radius Sigma so this is the plan So we choose some radius sigma So this radius sigma is going to be uh, between 9 over 16 and 5 over 8 I mean this 9 over 16 is below 3 over 2 uh, 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 Sorry, it's below 3 over quarter and this 5 over 8 is above 1 over 2 Somehow that's the whole focus of doing this and what I will do is I will also choose another small parameter k or kappa choose another parameter kappa bigger than zero okay this 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 uh, um, this, uh, uh, this sigma will be chosen with a Fubini argument I will tell you in, in a second but then what I want to do is I just want to construct a new, a new function so the new function that I want to construct is some function v prime. So v prime is going to have the following properties: it's going to be equal to v on the wall of radius uh, uh, on the sphere of radius sigma. Okay, um, it's going to be equal to. It's going to be equal to um, W of sigma x uh, divided by R1 on x belonging to the sphere of radius R1 and R1 is going to be sigma minus e to the power kappa and then it's going to be equal to uh, Z of um, sigma x divided by R2 and this is for x belonging to the ball of radius R2 and R2 is going to be equal to sigma minus 2 e to the power kappa okay and then okay so it, it's it's easier to describe than, than to give you the formulas okay so here's the situation this is the sphere of radius sigma here I'm going a little bit inside and how much I'm going inside is e to the power kappa and this is going to be the sphere of radius r1 and here is going to be the sphere of radius r2 okay and inside here I'm sticking the function z but I'm sticking the function z which is slightly homotetized so that the trace the trace of the function v prime on this sphere is equal to essentially the trace of Z on this sphere. Okay? So just rescale it. 
And in, 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 a, in a radius in between, I'm going to be actually the trace of the function w. Okay? And then I, I make a smooth interpolation between these two guys. Okay? So in here, I make a smooth interpolation between the trace of v on sigma and the trace of w on sigma, but on a slightly discrete version. And here, I make a smooth interpolation, I mean, a, a linear interpolation between w and z in here. Okay? So, so here I make a radial interpolation. between uh, V and W. And here I make a radial interpolation between um, W and Z. OK, so how do I make a radial interpolation to see I put uh, polar coordinates, <coughs> and then between two points which are sitting on the same radius emanating from the origin, I take, for instance, in the first corona, I take the value of the function v. On the outermost point, I take the value of the function w in the innermost point. And then I make a linear interpolation between the two on that small radius which is in between. And now I want to estimate how much is the L2 norm of the of the interpolation. Of the and the L2 norm of the gradient of the interpolation. Okay, so let me just write uh, the following uh, 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 simple inequality, which you can check by elemental means. Um, So if I want to estimate, uh, say, the energy in the ball of radius sigma minus the ball of radius r1 of the um, uh, db prime squared, okay? So it's not too difficult to check that you get the following uh, uh, inequality. So this is going to be less or equal than a constant. And then you have the size of the corona which is e to the power uh, kappa. And then you have the integral over the sphere of radius sigma. And here you have dv squared plus dw squared, which you are kind of joining. OK? And uh, then you have plus. one over e to the power kappa and then you have the integral so here you also have a constant and here you have db sigma and then you have <coughs> w minus v squared okay so that's an elementary computation right so because somehow you are, you are interpolating function v prime of x right i mean it looks a little bit like uh, uh, something like uh, 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 lambda uh, v of, and then here there is uh, some number, but I mean, like, this is the type of interpolation that I want to use. Mm. This is the type of interpolation that I want to use, right? So this would be the correct interpolation um, uh, if I'm trying to interpolate between. 1 and 0, so I have a similar interpolation when I'm inter interpolating between sigma and sigma minus e to the power k. Right? 
right? And, and, and sigma is bound away from, from zero. <coughs> So this is an elementary computation that I leave to you when you just plug in the definition of this rather interpolation. So now, by Fubini, so remember that on the ball of radius, uh, say, B3 half, right? So both this area, the, 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 the energy of these two guys is bounded by a constant times the excess, OK? So I can actually find a radius e, a radius by Fubini, such that uh, 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 this over here is bounded by a constant times e. Okay. So now here I have e to the power kappa as the denominator, but you might actually notice that uh, what is the integral of um, w minus v squared? Um, Okay, so the integral of w minus um, uh, v squared, um, I want to show that it's um, less or equal to something which has a higher power. Um, let's just check this. So I want to actually show that this is less or equal than a constant times e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda times something which is slightly larger. OK, so I should actually be able to get um, uh, this one. This is divided by uh, m minus 1. OK, so how do I actually do this? on the ball of radius 3 half. Um, OK, so W and V, so here is the ball of radius 3 half, right? So there is the complement of the set K. So here there is somehow, uh, say, a set K where V is equal to W. OK, and then there is a complement set where they disagree. OK, and the complement set where they uh, uh, disagree the complement set where they disagree has um, size v3 half minus k, which is bounded by e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda. OK, so now let me take a point x, which is, so let me, let me take a point x, which is over here. And uh, uh, let me see what is the uh, smallest distance to uh, uh, a point in k. Well, uh, if, if I take somehow the smallest distance to a point k, you will see that this ball can have radius <laughs> at most um, e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda divided by uh, m. Okay, so. So for every x which is in the complement of k, so the distance between x and k is less or equal than e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda uh, to the power 1 over 2 lambda. OK? Uh, right. OK, so here, I'm going to have this guy. So now, when I estimate the difference between Wx and Vx, okay, so W and V, they actually agree on the set K, so I can just say that this is less or equal, 
then the Lipschitz constant of V plus the Lipschitz constant of W, and then I have here the distance between X and K. Right, and now this is an absolute constant, so this is going to be less or equal than a constant, e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda to the power 1, uh, uh, so 2, 1 over 2n. Okay, so now, how do I estimate this quantity over here? Well, the, 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 the place where the two functions disagree is the complement of k, and here I have to integrate w minus v squared, and here I can just say this is less or equal than the signs of b3 half minus k. Uh, and then I have the uh, uh, c0 norm of w minus b squared. Okay? And now you see that this has a size e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda. Uh, and then this guy over here has 1 over 2m to the power 2, so I get 1 plus 1 over m. Okay. Can you explain again why it's 2m and not m? Uh, so volume, it should be the radius. I don't know, no, 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 yeah, it's 1 over m, yes. Well, it even helps me somehow. I, I was shy. <laughs> <laughs> it helps me even better. I mean, okay, so here I'm going to get actually 2 over m. Yes. So now you see what is going to happen somehow over here. What is the estimate that I have? Is I mean now again by a Fubini, I can choose a radius sigma where uh, this integral is comparable to this estimate. So of course I have to now be careful with Fubini because I need a radius which makes happy both this integral over here and that integral over there. So that's a tiny technical detail. And then if I choose the correct radius, I will get the following estimate, right? So I get uh, the estimate, this is a constant e to the power of 1 plus kappa. And then here is going to be a constant e to the power 1 minus 2 lambda, then 1 plus 1 over 2m, and then I have minus kappa. And OK, the whole game is actually to show that this thing, of course, is going to be positive. If lambda is uh, 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 sufficiently close to uh, 0, this becomes almost 1 plus 1 over 2m. And if kappa is sufficiently small, this uh, exponent over here is still bigger than 1. OK, so this is an exponent bigger, bigger than 1 if kappa and lambda are chosen accordingly. <coughs> Now I want to do a similar estimate on the inner values. On the inner values, I have w and z, right? So in the, in the inner values, I have w and z, and I have that uh, uh, z is the component convolution of uh, w. So I will have a very similar estimate, which makes the same idea work. So of course, when I make a convolution, uh, the empty norm of the uh, gradient is not going to be uh, increased. Well, it might be increased by the fact that the convolution is going a little bit outside of the domain, and that's why I'm actually taking sigma not between three half, uh, not not between uh, three quarters and one half, but I'm taking sigma between those two strange numbers. So I allow a little bit of room to wiggle. Right, so now I have to follow a simple estimate that the integral of dw squared on the ball of radius, what was it? Uh, 5 or 8? Something like that. Okay, so this guy is less or equal than the integral on the ball of radius 3 half of w of d squared. So that's just because of the properties of the convolution. Uh, and, and sorry, this is z. Okay, and this is um, w. And what is the integral of b five? I mean, over b five or eight of um, z minus w squared. Okay, so here remember this one is the convolution with the kernel e to the power theta. Okay, and there's a very simple estimate which is telling you that this is less or equal than a constant. And then you have e to the power 2 theta. And then you have the integral over b. Uh, okay, 
this is the quarters. Uh, here you have three quarters, and here you have p dot squared. Okay, and this is going to be less or equal than a constant e to the power one plus two theta. Okay, so you see again that on the uh, uh, L2 norm of dw uh, squared um, uh, on the on the on the L2 norm of dz squared, I have a constant times e, and then when I use that interpolation, I gain because I have a, a small size for the corona, so I get super linear. In the in the in the um, in the derivatives when, when when I have the derivatives appearing, then I have the size where I have the distance between the two functions, and I have the sides of the corona going down in the denominator. But in the numerator, I have this e to the power two theta. So this time I play the parameter kappa to the parameter theta. So I take the parameter theta larger than the parameter kappa, and I get a very similar estimate also for the integral of dv prime squared between b r one and b r two. Okay. Very good. So now what do I know? So now I want to estimate the uh, volume of the graph which is lying over the corona when I'm making this fetching and now I use the um, remark that the area functional is controlled by 1 plus a constant times dv squared and so you see that I start getting an estimate which is kind of interesting So the volume of the graph of V prime on the corona, so V sigma minus V R1. So this is going to be less or equal than the size of the corona plus a constant times the integral over the corona of V B prime squared. Okay, and now I don't want to be too details. This is going to be less or equal, of course, than v sigma minus v r1. And here there is a constant times e to the power 1 plus something. Okay? Positive. Which depends on all these three parameters that I can optimize. Okay? Now I want to estimate the volume of the... Now I want to estimate the... Uh, uh, integral of dv prime squared over, uh, um, uh, okay, this is up to actually. <coughs> okay, this is up to. Okay, so now I want to estimate this guy over here. Well, first of all, notice that uh, in R2, my function is a rescaling of the convolution and the size sigma, right? So when I'm actually, when I'm actually mm, rescaling down, I'm only losing energy, right? So I, I have this obvious inequality. Right, that's because uh, d prime of x is equal to z of um, um, up to divided by sigma times x <coughs> or x in two. Okay, and up to divided by sigma is simply less than one. Okay, and now what is actually this guy over here? Well, let me make the following estimate. So I want to estimate the modulus of dz. Okay, so this is equal to 
the modulus of d of w star phi e to the power theta. Okay, now I, I am very sloppy. I'm doing something which looks crazy. So I'm actually putting the, uh, uh, I mean the, the convolution kernel outside. Uh, when I'm putting the convolution kernel outside, uh, this map can take phi bigger or equal than 0 as a convolution kernel. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to do the following. So I'm going to say this is less or equal than, and then here I have dw, and then I take the characteristic set, I mean the characteristic function of k, star phi n, okay, and, and here I take uh, modulus of dw, and I take the characteristic function of the complement of k. And now I do star phi n. Oh, um, sorry, and this is e to the power t. Okay, now I want to estimate the two things separately. So first of all, what is the integral over b sigma of this part of dw 1k star phi to the power e, uh, uh, e to the power theta. Okay, so this I can estimate, um, and then I have to square it. Okay, so this is less or equal than the integral over b, and I'm, now here I have to put something like sigma e to the plus e to the power theta, and then I have to put w in the d squared. Uh, intersecting with K. Okay, and that's just because the convolution is going a little bit outside. Okay? Uh, and now, here I'm just going to do the following inequality, so I'm just going to say, okay, this is less or equal than the integral. Here I have dv squared, and here I have b sigma intersected with k. Okay, so now here I have something like uh, integral of b sigma plus e to the power theta, and then I have to take out b sigma of dv squared. So now here I have a corona of size e to the power theta. So what is the size? I mean, what is the size of, I mean, of, of, of this quantity over here? Well, again, I have to make some discretized for this argument this time, right? So I have to choose my sigma correctly. But if I choose my sigma correctly, the size of this integral should be the total integral of dv squared over the whole ball of radius, I don't know, three quarters multiply by the size of the corona, right? So if I have too many coronas where this volume is too large, then I add them all up and I get something which is too large, right? So by choosing sigma correctly, so I can estimate this guy by a constant times t, which is the total integral of dv squared over the whole ball of radius uh, three uh, quarters, one plus t. And now, what about uh, the remaining part? Um, so, for the remaining part, I have the following estimate. So,
<coughs> so now I want to estimate this guy. Uh, was it e to the power of theta? No, I think it was e to the power of lambda, actually. Uh, or was it e to the power of theta? No, it was e to the power of theta. No, no, e to the power of theta, that's okay. Okay, so now here I'm using uh, the sloppy uh, uh, estimate again. So um, the, the Lipschitz constant of dw was e to the power of lambda. Okay, so here I'm, I'm, I'm putting the L infinity norm of dw And then I have this convolution. Okay, and now this is estimated by e to the power 2 lambda. I have the uh, complement of k, n1 norm squared, <coughs> and the phi e to the power theta, l2 norm squared. Okay, so now this gives me e to the power two lambda, the L1 norm of the of the indicator function of the complement of k is the size of the complement of k, which is e to the power one minus two lambda, and now this is multiplied by two. Okay, and what is the size of the uh, L2 norm of um, uh, uh, of this guy. Okay, if I have made my computation correctly, so this gives you e to the power minus n theta. Okay, so this guy somehow integral of phi of x divided by e to the power theta. Um, and then I have 1 over e to the power n theta. This is squared. Okay, and then I have to do the x. Uh, then I have a change of variables which is killing one of the denominators, e to the power n theta, but then the other one survives. And here it's what I have. And now once again you see that somehow now this theta is, is, is kind of bad, it's a negative uh, exponent. But here I'm exceeding uh, uh, 1 by a crazy amount, right? So this is, this is, this is uh, constant e to the power 2 minus uh, 6 lambda. So if I choose lambda small enough, I am bigger than 3 divided by 2. And if I choose theta small enough, I'm way bigger than 1, OK? So this is also less than equal to constant e to the power 1 plus something. Okay, now when I'm estimating the entire dw squared over the ball of the sigma. Okay, I have, uh, I have uh, this guy squared, this guy squared, and the cross product, right? So uh, this guy is, well, I keep this term, and then I have constant e to the power 1 plus something. gain something to the power 1 plus something on the uh, square of this term. And then the cross product, the cross product is the L2 norm of this guy, which is 1 half plus something divided by half. And then I have the L2 norm of this guy. The L2 norm of this guy is anyway uh, e to the power 1 half, right? So I'm still super linear. So here I still get e to the power 1 plus something. Uh, okay, now, why did I actually make all this business of um, um, coming down to this uh, uh, function v prime, which is equal to the function w inside? Well, you see, the function w is the convolution of the extension uh, uh, z, which was the function v on the good set. So the Lipschitz constant of this function w 
is at most the Lipschitz constant, I mean, is bounded by the Lipschitz constant of, um, so the Lipschitz constant of Z is bounded by the Lipschitz constant of uh, W, which is bounded by uh, e to the power of lambda. So this time I have small Lipschitz constant and this formal Taylor expansion that I did is not any more formal, it's a true Taylor expansion. So, when I'm looking at the n-dimensional volume of the graph of V' prime over the ball of radius R2, <coughs> okay, so what is this? This is now going to be this ugly integrand on the ball of radius R2. So it's going to be 1 plus um, whatever, the square root of, um, okay, so here I have uh, dz squared, and then plus uh, all the minors, and blah, 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 blah. And now here, I can really just say this is going to be less or equal than, okay, the um, uh, um, uh, so the sides of the ball of radius BR2. Then I have one half the integral of uh, gradient z squared. <coughs> and here I have BR2. And then I have a constant. And here I have the integral over the ball of radius R2. And I have dz to the power 4. But now, the Lipschitz constant of dz is e to the power lambda, so I can easily say this is less or equal than dr2, and then I have one half integral over the ball of the sigma uh, um, intersected k of dv squared, and then I have a constant e to the power 1 plus something. And now this Taylor expansion here also gives you e because I can take uh, uh, I can estimate here with a square, and here I can put e to the power of two lambda. Okay. Um, so, professor, mm -hmm. the last thing equality at the upper bore is the left hand side is the z right, but not the w right. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. The left hand side is. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's this Z that we wanted to estimate. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> yes, which is we call it. Absolutely. Okay, so now we are almost done. So now I can compare uh, the volume of the graph of V with the volume of the graph of uh, V prime inside the ball of the sigma, right? So because the trace of the two functions is the same. So V prime is a competitor, which is the reason why we went through the whole pain of estimating the differences in the column. Okay, so what I know now is that the volume of the graph of V prime on the ball of the sigma has to be zero equal and then the uh, n-dimensional volume of <coughs> the graph of um, V on the ball of the sigma. Okay, so now. Um, what we have on this estimate, okay, so what do we know? Well, we know the n-dimensional volume of the graph uh, of V on the ball of the sigma has to be less or equal than, um, well, we have Br2 plus one half integral of dv squared v sigma intercept k plus constant e to the power one plus something Okay, and then I have the quantity of the corona, but the quantity of the corona has a very similar estimate, so it's B sigma minus B R two, um, and here we still have the constant times e to the power one plus something. Okay, and what is the an estimate from below for the uh, n-dimensional volume of the graph of V uh, over V sigma. Well, now, once again, I take the good set and the bad set.
So So what is this guy? Well, this guy is going to be the integral over b sigma intersected with k, and then I have the square root of 1 plus v squared plus all the jets. Okay? And then, of course, I have the integral over b sigma minus k, and I have uh, 1 plus dv squared plus all the jets. Okay. So in here, I am in b sigma intersected with k. The maximal function of db is less or equal than e to the power lambda. So the function itself is actually less or equal than e to the power lambda, this guy over here. So here I can again use a Taylor expansion, but I'm going to take a Taylor expansion on the other side, right? So I'm just going to say this is b or equal than b sigma intersected with k. Um, OK? And then. Um, and then I have plus 1 over 2. I have the integral over b sigma intersected with k. And I have dv squared. OK. And then I have a fourth order term. But the fourth order term I can estimate with minus a constant times e to the power 2 lambda plus 1. OK. So here I would have, OK, so if you want, this is the, the term that I get from the uh, um, fourth order guy, and this is, of course, less or equal than e. Right? So here I have the uh, And what do I do over here? But uh, over here, I don't know anything. I, I know something trivial, though. This integral is bigger or equal than 1. So here I just plug in um, b sigma minus k, right, for this guy. It's like the stupid estimate. OK, now I put everything together. <coughs> So now, if you put everything together, uh, uh, what you sh should be getting is uh, an estimate on um, uh, right. So you should be getting some estimate on the complement. If I didn't do a silly mistake. So let me just scan this thing over here. Um, <laughs> that one is okay. Yes, I see. Um, this is actually too bad. OK, so this one here is too bad. Um, right, sorry. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not using this one is bigger or equal than 1. What I'm using is the following. So I'm using um, a cruder estimate, but not that crude. OK, so this one is bigger or equal than the integral over d sigma minus k. OK, and then I have square root of 1 plus uh, db squared. And OK, so now I cannot use the Taylor expansion, but I can still use that 
Uh, this thing, since the Lipschitz constant of V is less or equal than 2, is bigger than some constant, which I don't know. And I have this guy. OK, good. <coughs> Okay, so now I plug everything together. So uh, this thing over here is less or equal than that guy over there. And you see what I'm actually getting at. So this V sigma minus K intersected with V sigma actually gives me V, uh, v sigma, the volume of V sigma. This one also gives me the volume of V sigma all together. So these two things appear both on this side and that side, and they cancel. This thing appears both on this side and that side, and they cancel. This one is a constant times e to the 1 plus something. So what I actually conclude is that the integral over v sigma minus k okay, of dv squared um, is less or equal than a constant. And here I have the power e to the 1 plus something. OK, so now remember what was this v sigma minus k. So this was the set where the upper level of the maximum function is b or equal than e to the power 2 lambda. <coughs> And I have exceeded the, I mean, I, I have an estimate on the L2 norm, which is slightly larger. Then what I would expect naturally, because it should be E, but it's going a little super linear. So what I actually have gotten is that the integral of b sigma minus k of dv squared. OK, what is this guy? So this is the integral over x in v sigma such that the maximal function of uh, dv is bigger or equal uh, than e to the power 2 lambda of d squared. So this guy is less or equal than a constant to e to the power 1 plus something. OK? So for the people who are familiar with uh, Gagin's lemma and, and, and higher integrability things, actually this estimate over here, where you can quantify this something in terms of lambda, what is telling you is in fact telling you that the maximum function is in some LP for p strictly bigger than 1. But in particular now, if you want actually uh, a nice estimate on a new set K, what you could do is you could truncate with something which is, which is a little bit uh, worse than lambda by. Okay? So now look at the point X, say in B sigma half, right, where the maximal function of D squared is actually uh, uh, bigger or equal than E to the power 2 lambda by. OK, so this is the bad set. On the complement set, we have uh, a Lipschitz estimate. So now, if you look at actually the estimate which is in evans gallipi the estimate which is in evans gallipi is actually telling you that this is less or equal than uh, a constant. You divide by e to the power 2 lambda bar. That's OK. But now here, the integral that you're taking is over the ball of sigma. And you're taking a slightly smaller upper, uh, upper level. So you actually have to look at the points where dv squared are bigger or equal than e to the power uh, uh, 2 lambda bar divided by uh, uh, some absolute constant. OK? And here you have dv squared. OK, now somehow the places where these guys are bigger or equal than e to the 2 lambda bar is certainly contained in the places where the maximal function is bigger or equal than e to the 2 lambda bar. Uh, 
so here you have now the following estimate. This is not so equal than constant. Here you have e to the power 2 lambda bar. And here there is the power e to the 1 plus something. OK, and then you're playing the something game against the 2 lambda bar. And if you choose the lambda bar sufficiently small, here you're going to get something which is super linear with 1. OK, so it's not actually at the first step that you're able to estimate the size of this complement set, but it's at the next one. OK, so now we are almost done. I'm going to give you the last step of the proof of this excess decay. So what I'm just saying is I'm just giving you the key proposition that I want to prove for that. I would have liked to prove if I had more time. Uh, so the idea now is that I'm going to show you that this Lipschitz approximation, and therefore, even the function v itself, on a smaller values, must be close to an harmonic function. And the way I would argue if I had time is very similar to the way I'm arguing actually over here. So after substituting after substituting um, with the Lipschitz approximation that I got, if there were a competitor for this Lipschitz approximation which gains uh, a certain amount in the Lipschitz energy, in, in, in the Lipschitz energy, then by the Taylor expansion, I would actually a competitor which gains in the uh, um, in the um, area of the graph. Okay, so here is the proposition that I'd like to prove with this uh, Lipschitz approximation. So let VK from say the ball of radius one centered at zero into Rn be the sequence of Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz constant less or equal than 2. Uh, such that the graph of VK is area minimizing. And such that VK, which I define to be the uh, difference between the volume um, of the graph of VK and um, omega m. So this quantity is going to zero. <coughs> OK, if I have such a sequence, what I can do is I can consider the following discrete functions. So I consider FK to be VK. I subtract the average of VK on the ball of radius 1 minus EK to the power gamma, and I divide by EK to the power 1 half. OK, so these are functions FK, which have average 0. And we know that uh, on, on the ball of radius 1 minus ek to the power gamma. And we know that the L2 norm is of the size ek to the 1 half. So once we do actually this renormalization, what we know is that the average of, PK is, of fk is equal to 0. And the integral of dfk squared is uniformly bounded by some constant. OK, so now what I actually want to claim is that fk is converging strongly in W12 log to a harmonic function. So then there exists a subsequence and H harmonic <coughs> such that FK is converging to H strongly in W12 of BR for every R less than one. OK, and what is the idea? Well, the idea is the following. If 
So assume first that there is no strong convergence. Assume that there is weak convergence in the end. I mean, if there is weak convergence, it means there must be an energy drop in the Dirichlet energy. Okay. If there is an energy drop in the Dirichlet energy, the integral of dH squared is giving a certain constant compared to the, inter to, to the integral of dFk squared. So if I actually multiply again by dK to the 1 half, I get that the delivery energy of, of, of uh, EK to the 1 half times H is gaining uh, a fraction times the excess. Okay? And if I'm gaining a fraction times the excess, again by Taylor's function, this would mean that I will contradict the minimality of FK. Okay? And so that actually gives you strong convergence. And then if I have an harmonic competitor which is gaining energy with respect to H, the energy of H is the limit of the energy of the dFk squared. So when I go back and remultiply by this factor, I get a competitor for a sufficiently large Fk, which actually gains, again, a fraction of the excess. Okay? And by the expansion, again, this is not possible. Because the difference between volume minimizing and the decay minimizing is this power e to the 1 plus something. So that's all I can actually afford. Okay, so once I actually prove this proposition, I know, so this is a kind of compactness proposition, so once I prove this proposition, I know that if I choose my HS, my XS sufficiently small, there must be an harmonic function which is close, close meaning a fraction of the excess, to my function V, which is area minimizing. And now I can actually implement this decay of the absolute norm of uh, uh, the derivative of um, the harmonic function and upgrade it as a decay of the L2 norm of the derivative of my uh, 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 area minimizing graph. Okay, so and then that actually gives you the excess decay that we uh, 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 examined last time and uh, finishes the proof of the George's theorem. Oh. Okay, so in the remaining uh, 20 minutes, I start telling you uh, what are the ideas behind the C3 alpha estimates of Andrew's theorem. And then tomorrow, again, I will not be able to give you all the debates, but they are in the lecture notes. So tomorrow, I can give you at least a sense of why uh, the, the um, algorithm that we are um, sketching today is actually able to give you two derivatives more uh, for your function. <coughs> What I want to prove is the following. So this is Arnold's theorem. So again, I start with some u on the ball over this one, going into Rn, and we are minimizing. So the graph is area minimizing. The limit constant of my function u is less or equal than 1. And OK, so here there's, uh, there are two epsilons, so one which is depending, so there, there are two parameters, one which is depending on uh, m and n. Uh, there's another one which is also uh, probably called beta, depending on m and n. And then a constant depending on m and n. So if I have Lipschitz and the excess, at scale 1 is less than my epsilon, and this is sort of key. OK, then 
I know that I can estimate the C2 beta norm of the derivative of U uh, with a constant times the excess to the power of one half. So how am I going actually to gain these two more derivatives? Uh, okay, and here um, so I will be on on, 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 on a smaller um, on a smaller cube. So let me just draw a picture just to give you a sense of what this cube this cube is. So this sigma should be something like one over quarter square root of n. So this sigma is chosen in such a way that when I actually draw a cube of size uh, 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 two sigma, uh, then this cube is actually inside my, uh, say, ball of radius one half, right? So minus sigma sigma to the power m should actually be included in the ball of radius uh, one or two. funny thing. <clears throat> so what do I know about okay first let me maybe introduce a bit of notation. So there is going to be a parameter j, which is a natural number, and we are going to actually send j to infinity in a second. But so this parameter, with this parameter j, we do the following. So we subdivide my cube into cubes of size 2 to the power minus j. OK, we just take a regular grid. So for any n, uh, in the regular grid, so in the regular cubical decomposition, let us introduce two um, um, uh, definitions. So CL is going to be the center of the cube. And okay, L of L is going to be half the side length which we set to be equal to 2 to the power minus j. Uh, I guess if I set it equal to 2 to the power minus j, since square root of m is not an integer, I have to adjust my sigma kind of a little bit. Okay, so let's say sigma is going to be taken uh, well. Maybe I solve this annoying thing by putting just sigma to the power minus j in here. OK, so now what can I actually do in this situation? So in this situation, now I'm going to do the following. So here I have the cube. I go up and look at my point PL, which is lying on the graph about the center of the cube. Okay, so this is a point which is actually well inside the cylinder of uh, radius 1. So by applying the dodgy excess decay centered at this point, right, so I, I have somehow the cylinder of radius 1 now, I, I can start the dodgy the excess decay if I, have, if I am honest, and in the lecture notes I'm honest. I actually have to start with a cylinder which is centered at this point. I can center a cylinder of radius one half, and then I can apply a scaled version of either Georgie excess decay. So the excess on this cylinder is actually controlled by the excess on the larger cylinder times a 
an absolute constant because I'm decreasing the the um, the radius by a factor of one over two, which you know, is comparable to one. And then I know that in all the balls, my um, my uh, excess is decaying like uh, a power r to the two minus two delta. Okay, so the excess on the point p and and now I take a ball which is sufficiently large compared to uh, the size of the cylinder and the size of the cube. So this is going to be a geometric constant. <coughs> okay, this excess is going to be controlled by a constant times the excess E. And then I have L of L to the power 2 minus 2 delta. I cannot quite get the quadratic power, but I can get as close as I want, right? So, and I will choose actually delta sufficiently close to zero later on. Now, since I really want actually delta to be sufficiently close to zero later on, once I fix delta, I will get a threshold for epsilon. So, epsilon will have to be smaller than that threshold so that I can actually apply the De Georgi excess decay uh, with this delta. Okay? So now. On this ball, I can take an optimizer, an optimizing plane for the excess, and I can use the lemma from yesterday to, or two days ago, to look at the excess in a cylinder in a tilted system of coordinates. So the base of the cylinder has to be parallel to the plane which optimizes the excess. So now here I have the L, I have my ball, and there is a plane which I will call pi L. So pi L is a plane which optimizes the excess. Excess of the graph of u in this If you remember, we put the lemma that says that, oh, well, we have to go maybe on a slightly smaller cylinder. And then if I go on a slightly smaller cylinder, the graph of the function intersecting with the ball is all contained in my cylinder. OK, so this cylinder, for instance, it's OK to take it. So we are going, we are going to call it CL. OK, so this is going to look something like uh, the ball of radius C, L of L divided by 2. This is intersected with the plane pi L. And then I multiply by uh, PL orthogonal. OK, or actually some people like to put this notation over here, plus PL orthogonal. Okay. And yeah, I guess I have to do something like this. OK? So this is now the cylinder, and what I know, I know that, uh, so I proved actually this uh, uh, Lipschitz approximation on the cylinder of the use one, but by scaling, since by homotities everything is preserved, is area minimizing, the Lipschitz constant is preserved, and the excess scales appropriately, I can apply the Lipschitz approximation theorem inside this cylinder, and I get uh, a new nice function which approximates uh, a new nice function which is, has a bound of the Lipschitz constant and approximates my function. Okay, so. 
So let Fn be the Lipschitz approximation of the previous theorem. where we know that the Lipschitz constant of Fn right, is going to be a fraction of my excess, and the fraction of my excess is going to be something like e to the power gamma, and then I have L, L to the power 2 minus 2 delta to the power gamma. Okay? And I know that the set where the function Fl and the function u disagree, so if you want the uh, uh, n-dimensional volume of the symmetric difference between uh, um, u and uh, the graph of fl on half the cylinder let us call it c half so this thing over here is controlled by <coughs> well twice this guy Okay, but then uh, there is a descaling factor which is given by the size of the typical size of the graph at that scale, which is L of L to the power N. Okay, so I have these two things. Okay, so that gives me one function, but then there is another kind of relevant function, and the other relevant function that I have is, well, this function is only Lipschitz. Let us actually smooth it at that level. So let us define ZL to be uh, the smooth it. So the convolution of FL with a kernel, which has all the nice properties that you can imagine, and I'm actually smoothing exactly at the scale of my cylinder. Right? So this is the scale of the smoothing. Okay, so now this guy has a small Lipschitz constant compared to this plane. And if you remember, it was a corollary of our proof that this optimal plane is not going to be tilted too much with respect to the horizontal plane. I mean, the tilt between this optimal plane and the horizontal plane is going to be controlled by the initial excess to the power of 1 minus delta. Okay, so this was one of the effects. So if you want, we proved that the graph is C1 alpha. This plane is an optimizing plane for this graph, which is C1 alpha. It cannot possibly be sort of too tilted. Okay? So if it is not too tilted, this means that this function ZL, which has small Lipschitz constant with respect to this tilted uh, plane, is going to be the graph of some Lipschitz function on the horizontal coordinates on some domain. Okay? So now this introduces a new uh, function, which we call GL. So let the graph of GL be equal to the graph of ZL for some function GL, which is now defined in the original system of coordinates omega L, which is sitting in the plane pi zero and it's going to r to the power n. Okay? So now, when we are actually treating this graph, right, so this, this graph is over here, so what is the domain omega l? The domain omega l is given by the projection of this graph over pi zero. Okay, now, if the tilting of the plane is not too large and I have a control of the Lipschitz constant, this domain over here, <coughs> if, in fact, it's a kind of sloppy, it's a sloppy, uh, um, it's a sloppy um, uh, picture because this domain should be almost the projection of this ball down, which is almost an ellipse, right? So, but if I play the constants correctly here, I should actually include in my domain at least a ball of radius, say, uh, uh, one quarter or one over eight uh, times um, the sides of this ball, 
I mean, I'm using a constant each time when I go from this ball to this cylinder, then I have to go to the modification, which is slightly more inside to the approximation, then modification, which is slightly more inside, then I project, I get somehow something down here, but I'm losing something like a constant divided by eight L of F, okay? So, and if I choose my uh, constant for the initial ball large enough, what I want is that this domain over here covers my initial cube uh, where I started from. Okay, so this is going to be the ball of radius, say, constant divided by 8 times L of L. I'm thinking this ball is centered on the center of the cube CL, and I want this to contain somehow my cube L, maybe enlarged by a factor 2. Okay? So, slightly large. Okay, so now I have a smooth function which is defined down here, and supposedly this smooth function is a good approximation of my graph. So why, realistically, uh, this should be a good approximation of my graph? Okay, so when I go to the, to the typical system of coordinates, I first do the Lipschitz approximation. The Lipschitz approximation coincides actually with my initial graph, except for a very small set, which I have estimated, okay? They are doing this convolution. But then, our previous proposition is actually telling me my Lipschitz approximation, even the graph itself, is close to an harmonic function, okay? So if I take an harmonic function and I make a convolution and I choose my kernel spherical, right? I mean, depending only on the radius. Then if I'm convolving an harmonic function with a random convolution kernel, the harmonic function doesn't change because it has the mean value property. So if this guy is close to an harmonic function, say in L2, this convolution will not change actually the value of my FL too much. So the function is essentially remaining the same by, by, by being almost harmonic, okay? On this system of coordinates. And then I'm just putting the coordinates. So my function GL is a polar effect extremely close to my function FL in the typical system of coordinates, which is extremely close to my initial graph. Okay, so therefore what I have is on each cube, a function which is smooth and approximates my graph efficiently. Now it's natural to think that if I make a partition of unity and I patch all these functions all together, I probably get a global function, a globally defined function, which is very close to my uh, uh, area minimizing graph. Okay, so now. I make a partition of unity and I patch all these global approximations together. And I produce, for uh, want of, um, lectures in, uh, of, of letters in the Latin alphabet, I produce something which I know by zeta k with the Greek letter. going to look like this, so it's going to be something like the sum of theta L um, um, GL divided by the sum of theta L. So the theta L are some bound functions which are going to be equal to 1 over the cube, and then they sort of compactly support it in a cube of twice the radius. Okay, so if I if I know this theta L divided by the sum of the, all the theta L is a partition of unity subordinate to my gate. Okay, but now the theorem, which is the main theorem that we sketch tomorrow, is the following. Uh, okay, this, this is actually ZJ, because remember the idea is that the size of the cube is 2 to the power minus J times sigma. So if epsilon bar is sufficiently small, 
we are going to gain two things. Okay, and delta is close to zero. Two. Delta will be chosen before chosen epsilon bar. Okay, then we achieve two things. Well, one thing is actually very easy to inspect. This also, this actually only follows from the fact that I am doing this uh, uh, procedure to a Lipschitz function. So the zj are converging to my function v uniformly. That's pretty obvious somehow. This would actually work for every Lipschitz function. I don't need actually area mini any area minimizing. But what is actually the interesting part is that there will be a uniform estimate in the derivative of zj for some beta which is possible. And this uniform estimate will be in terms of the excess at the starting cylinder to the power one half. And now, of course, our theorem will just be proved by uh, uh, saying, so this is converging to you. The Arnold theorem will just be proved by saying, well, if you have a uniform estimate over here, then you actually pass it to the limit, you conclude that you has a C2 beta estimate on the derivative. OK, so then Arnold's theorem is just the corollary of this guy. OK, proving, so I will, not, I will not give you a proof of this, because this is, a, as I said, it's an easy exercise where you're only using the fact that you are, have a small Lipschitz constant. So the interesting point is why you get actually this uniform estimate. So there's a lot of painful things which are going on, which are technical lemmas on how you estimate different norms when you change system of coordinates. So uh, uh, I'm going extra time. Uh, I only promise to talk for another one minute. So one of the things that you might worry about is, um, so there are two things that you might worry about. And one, uh, one of course, is the following. So I am taking a partition of unity and I'm patching functions g m which are smooth. If I want a uniform bound on this guy, I need a uniform bound on each of these functions, right? So that is the first uh, thing that you have to worry about. The second thing that you have to worry about is that when I'm computing actually the derivatives, higher derivatives of these things with the partition of unity, right? So when I'm computing a derivative over here, for instance, what I will see is that there are derivatives which are falling on the function which is in the partition of unity. And the function is a bound function which is concentrated on a very tiny ball. Okay? So the higher derivatives I compute, the higher uh, uh, these derivatives are sort of the larger these derivatives are. So how can they possibly be killed? Well, if the function GL uh, were equal to the nearby functions, right? So you wouldn't see it in the summation, you would see the summation of the partition of unity, which is equal to one. So the fact that I have very high derivatives in the bound function must be compensated by the fact that the two nearby functions for two squares, they have to be very close in the C0 norm, in the C1 norm, in the C2 norm, in the C3 norm to get this estimate. So there are two issues that I have to show you. One issue is that each single piece has a uniform C3 estimate. And the other issue is that if I take two nearby pieces, they must be close in C3 to get the uniform estimates over here. And somehow, they are actually both taken care of by the same idea. So the reason why I'm actually able to get a uniform estimate on this piece is because I really estimate the difference when I do the approximation on the previous grid, which is sort of slightly larger. Mm -hmm. So I will start uh, introducing a funny notation that uh, a cube in my grid at size 2 to the minus j is the sum of a cube at the previous grid uh, is the grandson of a cube on two twice, I mean, twice previously, and I will estimate the difference between sun and father. And somehow you imagine that if I'm able to estimate the difference between sun and father, I should be able to estimate the difference between two brothers, for instance. So that is when the two cubes are nearby. So there will be an effect of the same estimate. I will estimate actually between sun and father, and then I will start from, say, the ancestor, which starts at, at size one. And I will estimate the C3 norm, for instance, by a convergent series. And I will show you that there is a uniform bound. Now, the very same estimate that you get for each term in the convergent series is kind of the estimate that you have between two nearby cubes. So in a sense, even though I have two different issues, 
they can be solved with the same idea. And, and, and that's what I will show you. But Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Maybe I'm missing something, but um, is there anything preventing you from getting uh, estimates for higher norms beyond? Uh, yes. So there, there, I have to show you why. Um, okay. So there, I have to show you why I'm able to get. I mean, I'm, I'm able to get an estimate between father and son, which is a Bessy norm, but I'm not able to get an estimate at the uh, sort of C4 norm. So the reason is that I'm, I'm making this modification, right? So okay, the, the, the Lipschitz approximation is already modifying my function. And then I make this uh, modification. Now, I'm doing the modification, but I could do something else. I could, for instance, solve the Dirichlet problem and stick the harmonic function, which is closer to this guy. Okay. So at all effect, what I'm actually doing, I'm, I'm replacing my function over there, and I'm replacing with an harmonic function. So if the harmonic function is really a very good approximation of my initial function, then that will give me some estimates. But ultimately, I cannot hope of adding estimates of multi derivatives. If I add estimates of multi derivatives somehow, it would come out that my function is essentially harmonic, the one I want to try to approximate. So that is not correct, because the function is not solving the harmonic uh, uh, equation, is not solving the Laplacian equal to zero, it's solving the uh, minimal surface equation. So what I'm actually using is that in this system, in this stupid system of coordinates, my function is almost harmonic, and I really have to play how close it is to be harmonic. It's harmonic up to, I don't know, three orders, essentially, three, fourth order. Somehow, when I, when I take the fourth uh, um, Taylor polynomial in the expansion on that system of coordinates, it ceases to be harmonic. So this algorithm cannot possibly capture the fourth order polynomial in the, in the Taylor expansion of my function. So if you want to capture that, Instead of solving the uh, uh, Dirichlet problem, or instead of replacing with an harmonic function, you have to replace with an actual solution of the minimum surface equation. So if you have a theorem which tells you, like when you are sufficiently small in some sense, there is a smooth solution of the uh, uh, minimum surface equation, uh, then you can try to use that. And somehow, in co-dimension 1, this would be obvious, because it's, it's a very well-known theory. In higher co-dimension, it's still true that if you're small in a, in a, in a good sense, you actually have a, 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 um, a solution of the minimum surface equation. It would give you better estimates in this theorem, but it's not going to be useful for me in the other situation in which I have these um, multi-branches and so on, because I would face again the same problem. I'm actually approximating something which is multi-branched, OK, I'm using maybe the minimum surface equation for the middle branch. But what I really want to approximate is the sum of them all. And the sum of them all is not satisfying the PDE. It's, it's, it's just because the PDE is more linear. So then I don't think it's actually going to give me uh, better estimates anyway. But in this simplified situation, you might get better estimates if you try something more linear. OK, so thank you. Five